I'm going to start by introducing our speakers for tonight. So the Honorable Daniel Janner QC is a criminal defense lawyer. He's a bencher of Middle Temple, and he founded FAIR, falsely accused individuals for reform, after his father, the late Lord, da Lord Janner, was accused of sexual offenses. Paul Gambaccini graduated from Dartmouth College, where he was general manager of WDCR, then the nation's largest radio station run by students. Paul is the only broadcaster to have had his own series on BBC Radio 1, 2, 3, and 4. His thousands of television appearances include regular slots on BBC One, BBC Two, ITV, Channel Four, and Sky. Paul has been named Philanthropist of the Year and is in both the Radio Academic Hall of Fame and the British Softball Federation of Fame. So, can everyone please give a warm round of applause for our speakers tonight? Right, so Paul and Daniel will be speaking about falsely accused individuals for reform, analyzing how the criminal law should approach accusations of sexual assault. Um, Daniel, do you want to begin with your remarks? Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, good evening, everybody. Madam President, um, I am very privileged uh, to defend my late father's name, uh, particularly here in this uh, wonderful institution where we both served as president. Uh, he was president in Lent 1952 and I was president in Michaelmas 1978. So thank you Madam President for giving me this uh, opportunity to do so. Now uh, ladies and gentlemen I tell his story as an illustration of the post Savile hysteria which gripped this country in 2014. It was a hysteria which was whipped up. It was whipped up by politicians like Tom Watson for political gain and encouraged by dubious news outlets like Exaro News. And many good people were caught up in this. The effect on their professional and personal reputation and their families and friends uh, remains huge and permanent given that false claims lie forever on the internet. And uh, let me say this right at the outset, that false claims also discredit the impact of the claims of genuine victims. And our heart goes out to them. But I'm privileged to be working with a group of people uh, to produce some good out of the evil of false allegations. And what we're doing is we're trying to restore balance in the criminal justice system. So together with uh, Paul Gambaccini, uh, Sir Cliff Richard, Stephen Fry, uh, and the support of politicians, journalists, and lawyers, we are campaigning for law reform. And so we have formed an organization, a pressure group, uh, which is not just for the well-known, but for everybody. And that pressure group is named Falsely Accused Individuals for Reform, FAIR, and more about that later on. But let me just tell you a little about my father's story because it mirrors other cases. I suppose the most famous, the most notable, being Sir Edward Heath. In Sir Edward's case, there was one central false accuser. Uh, that was followed by a highly publicized press conference in Salisbury. Do you remember that? Do you remember that press conference with the policeman standing outside his home in Salisbury? Uh, some, um, the chief constable of Wiltshire, Mike Veal, claimed, a quote, I'm 120% convinced that Edward Heath was a paedophile. And take it from me as a criminal lawyer that had he been alive, Sir Edward Heath would have been interviewed under caution. No doubt, given the weight of numbers, and this is very often a numbers game, and the CPS policy under the uh, leadership of the former Director of Public Prosecutions, uh, Alison Saunders, and he probably would have been charged. But as you now know, thankfully, those allegations have unraveled against him and many others because they were a combination of fantasists and opportunists, and no one believes a word of it. 
Now, my father's case followed the precise same pattern. One central complainant, a highly publicized search, <clears throat> and 30 plus, yes, 30 plus, and the numbers uh, still increase, um, of so-called victims, note so-called victims, not complainants, jumped, jumping on the bandwagon. And allegations of an establishment cover-up, and my father then dying, too ill to be interviewed, so um, brain dead, uh, but not dead um, in 2014, not dead yet, because he died in 2015. And uh, like uh, Heath, died an innocent man, never convicted of an offence. He was a successful barrister before he was elected as MP for Leicester West in 1970, happily married for over 40 years, three children, and an effective high-profile backbencher. He, he was also kind and generous to young and old, male and female, taking uh, the deprived under his wing, stemming from his army days as a war crimes investigator, he worked in the Kinderheim at Belson, Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, where his role, he was only 18, 19 at the time, was the rehabilitation and mentoring of gravely damaged child survivors of the Holocaust, which haunted him for the rest of his life, and we believe accounted for his attitude throughout his life to underprivileged children from broken homes. And we met many such children over the years. <clears throat> One such person I now turn to, who I call Mike. I will say more, as Paul will say more, about uh, anonymity in due course. But Mike has anonymity. And in 1975, Mike was aged about 15. My sisters recall him, I recall him. And he was in care, in a care home in Leicester. And as a family, all of us looked after him for some months. But uh, there came a time when he repeatedly stole from the family and we had to say goodbye, and nothing was uh, thought about Mike for about 16 years, until 1991. When in 1991, a Leicester care home manager called Frank Beck was charged with the most horrendous sexual offences. Frank Beck was evil, and he was tried, and he was convicted, and he received three life sentences. He died in prison. But his defense at trial, that he wasn't the abuser, but Jana was. That my father was the abuser. So Beck called Mike, his star witness, but he was cross-examined by the Crown, and uh, Mike was disbelieved by the jury, and Beck was disbelieved, uh, and Beck uh, obviously was convicted. Now, the jury uh, was right, because important things have since that trial emerged about Mike. First of all, we now discover he himself was an abuser of children younger than him when in the care of Beck. So uh, easy to be blackmailed into giving evidence on behalf of Beck for him. Uh, he wasn't just dishonest, but in 2002, he himself uh, received a uh, long prison sentence for abusing a boy. Thirdly, shortly after Beck's conviction, my father received a letter from Beck's former cellmate, whose name was Norman Newell, and it's significant because he wrote a statement to the police. He was in remand with him. It's three pages, I quote, three lines. He told me he was going to drag all the top people in. I asked him what he meant. He said he got one of the kids to say that Greville Jan had taken him to Scotland and buggered him. I told him it was dangerous bringing politics into it and asked if it was true. And he said no, but it would throw the light off him. So Beck's convicted. My father then makes a personal statement in the House of Commons uh, in which he said, and I quote, I have been able to ride out the agony on this, of this ordeal in good heart, but it hasn't been easy. As a member of parliament, I am now well placed to fight back. Uh, that would not have applied to any of our constituencies, constituents or any other citizens placed by law in this impossible and unjust situation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as far as we were concerned as a family, after that statement, that was it. An end of an ugly chapter, and in 1997, my father was made a peer. Then we fast forward. We fast forward to 2013. When out of the blue, um, in fact, I heard about this when one of my daughters phoned me. I was in court uh, at the time saying, um, Dad, come round quick. Papa's flat is being searched uh, by um, 
I think it was about 18, maybe more, um, Leicester police officers who turned up without any warning at 7 in the morning. So he was now 85, very serious dementia, near to death. My mother had died t 10 years previously, and he was living alone with a carer and was very frightened. Far too ill to be interviewed. So unlike those such as Harvey Proctor and others who, and Cliff Richard for that matter, others who are able to deal with the allegations in interview, he never got that chance because he was too ill. That didn't put the police off, whose mindset was that they're dealing with a monster. How do we know that? Because that's how they described him to our f family and friends and others who the police went around to take statements from. So their mindset was guilty. And it went further than that, because following the very same pattern as in the Cliff Richard case and the Heath case, the police put out an advert with a phone number to basically trawl for others to come forward. In other words, to provide corroboration to, the, um, to what is unsustainable without rates of numbers. And I'll show you why I say that in a moment. But the accused, therefore becoming in Sir Cliff Richard's uh, graphic words, quote, live bait. And sure enough, the allegations were not just from Mike, um, but a whole load of other people. And there was no assessment of the claims, no sifting. And it included the following. Rape at the Colton Club. Yes, the Conservative Colton Club. Remember, he was a Labour MP. And this was made by a man called Carl Beach. Does that name ring a bell to you? Nick may certainly ring a bell to you. Uh, because he's um, now serving an 18-year sentence of imprisonment. Um, there was an allegation by somebody else of rape and torture, rape and torture, uh, covering an entire weekend in a London hotel. Uh, the police never spoke to us, never spoke to me or my sisters, never asked for his passport. Had they done so, they would have shown within this three-day period uh, he wasn't in Leicester or in France, but he was actually in Australia throughout that weekend and on either side. Um, one claimed my late father sexually abused him in the company of a living cons former Conservative cabinet minister. And I quote from his statement to the police, there was X, whose name I will not reveal, um, to be out there for all time, besmirched by a false allegation. There was X, quote, he always came with gravel. And then goes on to describe how the two of them sexually abused him. And here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, my father was charged on this allegation in due course. And as that Conservative cabinet minister, he knows perfectly well about this, is alive and well known. So preposterous allegations completely out of character from a man, a public servant of impeccable character of the highest repute. Um, very high profile, particularly in the public eye in Leicester, where all the allegations safe for Nick came from. And just to show you how insane this had become, what a mad world we're now entering into, I got a phone call from the Leicester police in June 2014 asking whether... Imagine if this is you, asking whether I had been sexually abused by my father. So put yourself in, in my shoes and imagine how you'd feel being asked that about the person you love and know to be innocent. I didn't lose my call. I simply said, um, slightly light, well, officer, uh, thank you for phoning. Um, you can save yourself the cost of the trip down and your uh, team, because my father was a wonderful, generous, lovely person ever who only showed kindness to me and everybody else I'd ever met. Oh, no, sir, very sorry, can't have that. Um, we're sending down a specialist team to interview you. So down they came to my chambers, uh, and the specialist uh, team was told exactly the same thing, and you paid for it. So where are we now? We're in 2015, a year's investigation, which I believe would come to nothing, and Alison Saunders, the, the, the DPP, puts out an announcement, too ill to be tried. That led to a massive uh, storm, in the press, um, uh, the rape of justice fueled by civil solicitors. And they play a very important part in this because they put out adverts in the uh, 
in, in the prison newspaper asking for people to come forward. And lo and behold, in flood the civil letters before action. But it would help their case. Any lawyers here? Hands up, any lawyers out of interest? So a fair smattering, good, about uh, a third of you. Well, you will know that it will help in a civil case if we got um, a conviction by a jury. Well, they weren't going to get that because he was too ill to be tried. But whilst he was still alive, there is a procedure following a finding of incapacity for so-called findings of fact. And that's to do with mad axemen who are kind of locked away for a long time. Before that, they've got to make sure the act happens. So it's, a, it's actually a procedure not designed for this. We would have challenged it as an abuse of the process. But um, this is what we were facing. And this happened because the solicitors put in a victim's review of the decision, and with the weight of the press behind them, the decision not to charge was overturned, and we had the ugly spectacle of him being dragged to Westminster Magistrates Court, the streets were all closed, a double incontinent, I might add, weeks, weeks from death. We asked for a, a video link, turned down. That's how mad and bad the time was. Uh, no doubt to the extreme annoyance of the civil solicitors, they weren't going to get their fact-finding finding because he inconveniently died on the 19th of December 2015. Ah, but that didn't end the civil cases, of course, because they proceed against the estate. It wasn't a massive estate, but enough. And there were nine issued high court claims, 33. We've gone up to 33 letters before action, all banking on a settlement, all banking on a family folding. Confident, they knew about the limitation period. And um, that limitation period was a hurdle which uh, they were confident would be overcome in a judge's discretion. But by now, we had clear exculpatory evidence. None complained against my father when he was in care, although they complained against others. Not a single word against my father in any social service file of any complainant Clear evidence of manufacturing false claims, some as you would have picked up already, pure fantasy. And none other than Mike came forward during that 1991 trial, which was on the front page of every paper, during the Beck trial, to claim abuse by my father. And many had a track record for serious dishonesty. But the civil claims, every single one of them, when faced with this, collapsed and were dropped. They fell like dominoes, and not a single penny went their way. And at last, we had some justice. Of course, we would have fought all the way, but we had justice. Sadly, though, it's not the end of the story. Uh, you may have heard of ICSA, the beleaguered inquiry into child sex abuse, previously known as the Goddard Inquiry. Now, that inquiry, ladies and gentlemen, was set up in the wake of the hysteria that I have mentioned. Mrs. May was lobbied, and the easiest way to deal with this strong lobbying, and at that time it actually centred on Leon Britton, was to set up ICSA. This massive, uncontrolled, what did Boris describe as splaffing up £60 million inquiry, telling us nothing actually we don't, uh, in my respectful opinion, don't already know. But there it is. But this Judge Goddard decided that my father's case merited a strand entirely to himself. There are, although he's, it's, this is meant to deal with institutional failings, but um, as far as I'm aware, he, my father founded institutions, but he was never an institution. And she decided, no, um, uh, unlike the Roman Catholic Church or Westminster, there's got to be a whole strand on my father. He, and the unfairness of this, from our family's point of view, apart from the fact that he happens to be innocent, is he can't answer back from the grave. Allegations will be made in public without us even being able to cross-examine. And you already know I've got plenty of material to cross-examine these people on, and we are refused the right to cross-examine. Goddard's successor, because she was um, discredited and, and uh, <coughs> made her way back to New Zealand, uh, Professor Jay, still refused to drop the strand despite the civil proceedings collapsing. So we are faced with a three-week Kafkaesque inquiry next year, which will be nothing more than a macabre show trial based on an assumption of guilt. 
overturning the presumption of innocence, uh, which lies the golden thread lying at the heart of the criminal justice system and an inevitable character assassination. But we will not have it, and we shall fight it. But can I just end um, my, um, <clears throat> my words to you, having given you that example, by drawing together certain wider implications which my father's case has um, and others that I've mentioned. I think the tide has turned, the Nick trial particularly, um, and, and in fact cases like Paul's, um, <clears throat> there is a wider recognition that fraudulent civil claims are being made, uh, riding on the back of this post-Savile uh, frenzy, and a recognition that, of course, there are genuine um, uh, victims uh, and perpetrators who must be punished. But equally, there are, sadly, opportunist fantasists who do exist. Secondly, uh, we are campaigning for a change in terminology, and terminology is important. Words count. So, um, victims, they don't become victims until there is a conviction. So, they should be termed as complainants. An end to what was at the heart of so much of this, which is that the police believe all victims, as they would term them, And then this, we are campaigning for a law to provide for anonymity for those accused of sexual offences until charged. I will repeat that. To provide for anonymity for those accused of sexual offences until charged. It is limited, deliberately. But we say it would put an end to the catastrophic consequences of early publication of a suspect's name. And will end the highly publicised searches that uh, my family suffered, but to a, a minuscule extent to that of somebody like Cliff Richard. But it will protect the reputations of all innocent suspects from the stigma of a false sexual allegation. And it will provide balance, because you will know that a complainant's identity is protected in sexual offences, uniquely in sexual offences, for life. It will ensure open justice, since the accused identity will be known at trial. We're not trying to cut out uh, open justice. Um, and that protection only applying until charge and not beyond. And of course there's got to be provision for lifting the ban in exceptional circumstances. It can't be a blanket protection, a blanket provision. Uh, so an application within the legislation we're campaigning for uh, would be made or could be made to a judge by the police or the CPS, for example, uh, if a dangerous suspect, a war boy, needs to be apprehended and arrested. So that's what we're campaigning for. Um, we launched a parliamentary petition on the 1st of July and it attracted uh, over 28,000 signatures. Oh, forgive me for asking again of this audience participation way, but how, how many of you um, signed up to a parliamentary petition? Can, can you just lift your hands out of interest? So a number of you, well, you will know, won't you? It's, it's, it's a process. Because you have to, isn't there a verification process on your mobile? Yes, there is. So you not only do you have to do it, decide to do it, and think, oh, well, that's a good idea, but you've actually got to go through the motions of doing it. And 28,400 plus people went to that effort to sign up to our petition. It's actually been pulled now because of the election. But it is a fantastic start to our uh, campaign and we shall continue. So we say that these false claims can and must be fought in the name of justice and to preserve the good names of those falsely accused, dead or alive. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Daniel. That was so comprehensive, I need not say anything else. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> Actually, I would like to thank uh, Madam President for her very warm introduction at the beginning of the evening. Words that generous are usually followed by the words, he died yesterday. <laughs> but fortunately, I didn't. I'm here. And it's amazing how resilient we all are, because 
all of us who were in that false accusation craze of what is now six and five years ago. Most of us are still here. And uh, although some of us have chosen to disappear, uh, others have decided they must continue to fight for law reform. I was at home having given testimony to the Home Affairs Select Committee on the subject of bail reform. It turns out that uh, while I was on bail for a year without charge, some people were paying attention because uh, several members of the cabinet and the press had grown up as our fans, meaning Cliff Richard, myself, and a couple of the others, Jimmy Tarbuck. And uh, they were incensed by what had happened. And Lord Finkelstein, who was a fine columnist for the Times under the name of Danny Finkelstein, was also a member of the House of Lords. And so he would keep informed about my case, one of his friends in Parliament who was the Home Secretary of the time, Theresa May. And so it came to pass that six days after my case was dropped, she introduced her bail reform. So I was uh, testifying for the Home Affairs Select Committee, unknowing that I was being watched in Barbados by Cliff Richard. Only in the modern era could somebody watch you on Parliament TV from Barbados. And he called up, and he, and he was still under suspicion at the time. And he said, you've gotten this law reform. I want my law reform. And I want my law reform to be anonymity before charge. Because if we had not been named, we wouldn't have gone through any of this suffering. We could still have been accused. Some of us could still have been arrested. But if we were not publicized until we'd been charged, all of these consequences would not have happened. Now, what are all these consequences? They involve so many people. It's not just us who are affected. The day that I was arrested, the day I was being interviewed in Charing Cross Police Station, all of my relatives around the world were being contacted by the British media. My brother in New York uh, had a man from the Daily Mirror trying to get into the front door by uh, what they call tailgating, where uh, the reporter follows in a genuine resident who has opened the door. Now, thank God, my husband Christopher had had the good sense to call all our relatives around the world and say, don't talk to the press. And so my brother looked outside and said to the woman, who was the genuine uh, occupant, don't let that man in. And being a true New Yorker, she turned around and said, don't even think about getting in here. Uh, my two female cousins who lived in the state of Connecticut with different surnames in different towns were both contacted by the Daily Mail. I have to admit, I thought that was a pretty deep skullduggery there. Uh, and then uh, my brother who lived in Switzerland was contacted. And Christopher's parents, who lived in a village in Norfolk, were visited. And my former flatmate, who lived in Essex, was visited. In other words, all of their lives were affected by this. Completely out of the blue, they were told that I had been accused of what I was told were historic sexual offenses, to which my first thought, I had to admit, was, were they that good? Because, you see, I knew from the moment I was handled the accusation paper, A, I never knew these two people, and B, they're in the wrong decade. They were both claiming to have taken my virginity without knowing it. But I hadn't even begun having full same-sex relations. It was the dumbest thing that had ever happened to me. Why had it happened to me? Because I'd gone on television to talk about Jimmy Savile. I had the norovirus, which is the most hideous thing you can have short of death, because it feels like death. And I was called by Breakfast Television, whose studios were across the street from me at the time, 
saying, when I come in the following morning, there was going to be a documentary about the recently deceased Jimmy Savile, exposing him. And I thought, well, I feel terrible, but on the other hand, I'm not going to feel less terrible if I cross the street. I'll still feel bad. Might as well be doing something. And I said, the only condition I have is that the interviewer be Lorraine Kelly, who I knew and trusted. I'd worked with her in the 1980s. And so she said to me, uh, there's going to be this expose of Jimmy Savile. What do you think? And I said, I've been waiting for the story to come out for 30 years. What I had no idea of knowing was that that was the television broadcast I should never have made. Because sitting at home was a man who turned to his fiance and said, how dare he say that about Jimmy Savile when he did it to me. I'm going to get him. Now, it turns out that man, who was a serial drug abuser and former meth head, was also a serial unsuccessful accuser. Indeed, he accused two other people of frequently abusing him with a turkey. I'll rewind that. He accused two people, other than myself, of frequently abusing him with a turkey. Now, this didn't stop the police from arresting me. But I find it incredibly ironic that I was arrested for sexual offenses for having defended genuinely abused women. But that was the way it was in that couple of years. The police, desperately wanting to look like the savior of women, uh, asked people to accuse celebrities saying, you will be believed. And that was the philosophy there was a comedian called Jim Davidson whose uh, police officer team said to him on a couple of occasions, we know this sounds ridiculous, but we're under instructions, believe the accuser. And I find it terribly ironic that the cause of genuinely abused women has been hurt by the witch hunt and the attitude of believe every accuser. I always took this very seriously indeed because when I was at the other place, there's the big admission of the night, <laughs> one of my friends had a sister who was raped and murdered in Washington, D.C. And not only did it end her life, but it effectively ended the life of the family as it was lived at that time. The father thought that he had to leave government service and move out of Washington, D.C because although a man was sent to trial for the crime, in those days before forensic evidence with no DNA, he could not be convicted. And the father knew that if he stayed in Washington, he would track him down and kill him. And to remove that temptation, they had to move to New York, and the whole life of the family changed forever. And it is these knock-on effects that you don't think about when you think about accusations that are false. Cliff Richard and Lady Britton and I went to the House of Lords to make a presentation in 2014. Uh, 2015. And on that day, there was an anonymous letter posted in the press an open letter to Cliff, myself, and Nigel Evans, MP, saying, there must never be anonymity before charge, um, because other people come forward when someone is accused. And I said, and it was from the organization called End Violence Against Women, which is, frankly, from a PR point of view, the cleverest name anyone has ever come up with, because how can you argue with End Violence Against Women? Start Violence Against Women? No, no, no. So that was very clever. But the point being, they hadn't researched the cases to even realize that in all of the three cases that were being discussed that day, there wasn't a single female accuser. The accusers were all men. And what the police didn't factor in when they asked the public to accuse celebrities saying you will be believed was A, the reality of mental illness. But there are some people who are what I have politely called distressed. And they want to be part of the action, and when the police invite you to become part of the action, they will. 
And unfortunately, there are also some people who want money. And in the very quarter of 2012 that the police launched Operation U-Tree, Parliament introduced the Criminal Injuries Compensation Scheme of 2012, in which there was a table of 100 offenses for which you could claim compensation with the chilling line, conviction is not required for payment. And so, of course, you would have genuine victims, but you would have many people who just wanted a bit of cash. And indeed, one of them was the aforementioned Carl Beach, who, as you may know, if you followed the trial, got 21,000 pounds towards a Ford Mustang car just by saying he had been abused. I could go on and on about the effects this had on me, but it's more interesting to, to look at the effects it had on other people and on other organizations. I had been someone who raised money and supported the Labour Party for a quarter of a century. And that relationship was terminated in one day when I was uninvited to uh, appear at a fundraising dinner in which Keir Starmer was having his coming out appearance introduced by Ed Miliband. The irony is, is that the fundraising dinner had been inspired by my fundraising for the Terence Higgins Trust in uh, 1994, which won me fun the Philanthropist of the Year Award, which was the introduction of this American idea of a thousand pound a plate dinner. And it became, and noting the success of the Terence Higgins Trust campaign, the Labour Party started to have its own equivalent. So here it was coming up for the 2013 dinner, and I was uninvited from my own dinner by Ed Miliband, who said his thoughts were with the victims. Of course he never asked what it was about. None of them did. The BBC didn't when they took me off, year for, off air for a year which of course affected the lives of the people who happened to like my radio shows, God bless them. That's about a million people who missed their shows for a year. And then the uh, charitable organizations that I'd helped to fund, which did not support me, Amnesty International, the most disappointing of all, uh, would not take my calls, would not arrange a meeting, even though my name was and still is on their foundation stone in Shoreditch. And Stonewall, the LGBT charity whose original funding I helped to arrange, uh, said they could not help me. We very much were so under negative scrutiny because we'd been accused of historic sexual offenses by somebody that organizations shun. Individuals remain loyal. Your real friends stay with you. And when they do, you realize your love for them. And the love you feel for them is greater than the negativity thrown your way by the police. And so I have seen, as a result of this experience, the very, very worst of human behavior, which is not even the sick people who make things up. And believe me, we could spend the night talking about the howling factual errors in the accusation statements of these distressed individuals. And if any of you come to dinner with us, well, I'd be happy to tell you about it. But uh, it, 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 it goes beyond that. You really learn the depth of the support your true friends and family have for you. And you know you'll make it. You know you'll get through. And everything I do uh, on this issue which includes right now undertaking court proceedings against the Metropolitan Police, to which they must offer a defense by the 13th of December, is predicated by the fact that we know we're in the right and we have to fight for the right. I remember sitting in a cell, Charing Cross Police Station, the day I was arrested, waiting for a solicitor. Since I was uh, visited by the police at 4.38 in the morning, solicitors aren't immediately available. And I thought, they're making a huge mistake. But I had been a Martin Luther King kid when I was a boy. 
and I'd been a Nelson Mandela man. And if I thought these two great heroes of my lifetime could get through something worse than I did, then I had to rise to that occasion. And what we have to rise to the occasion now is the understanding that this is a very complex area. The crisis of genuine sexual abuse has not gone away, but there's now, we know, an equal crisis of false accusation. There is nothing harmed by waiting for charge. And if there's a question about that, I'll be happy to talk about it. War Boys was mentioned. All the police have to do is to say, has there been any woman who's been offered a suspect drink by a cab driver? And that would bring the same responses. So even the reprehensible people would be protected until they were charged with no ill effect on the victims. But all of the innocent people whose lives were ruined, whom I represent because I've been able to get back to my job, and many of them were not, we must go forward and spend the rest of our lives trying to protect other people from experiencing what we did. And I hope you'll support us. And if you are hesitant, I hope you'll ask us about it. Thank you very much. Great. So thank you both for your incredibly personal remarks. Um, I think in light of the personal nature of the remarks, I'd also just like to remind participants that obviously as Cambridge Union, we encourage our audience members to challenge and, and robustly question our speakers. But as it's a sensitive topic, please remain respectful of all parties involved. Um, before we get into the student q and I'm going to do a bit of moderated question and answer. Um, to start with, I think your remarks were both very useful for understanding the process in terms of an individual case of a sexual assault accusation um, in the UK. Um, but I'd like, in my questions, to take this back to speaking about the criminal justice system more broadly and how it deals with these instances, um, as well as, in particular, what you're campaigning for. Um, so in terms of the specific policies that you're advancing, the, the main one that you did your petition with is um, anonymity before charge um, in relation to sexual offences. Um, and obviously this is a policy which, which fits with innocent, uh, presumed innocence before guilt is proven and, and is important in the multitude of ways that, that you both spoke about. Um, however, I do have two questions on this point. And the first one is that, you spoke about how in specific cases where the safety of, of, of individuals around the person who had been accused could be compromised, there would be exceptions made um, and, and their name would, would be publicized. And the question, the first question is, how do we draw that line in the sense that in a lot of cases when someone is accused of multiple charges of sexual assault, it is difficult to tell when they, if they do present a genuine safety problem for the people around them. And the second thing is something that you touched on, Paul, is you, you talked about how, given that statistically an incredibly low amount of, of sexual assault cases are reported and prosecuted, um, a lot of the arguments that are advanced for making someone's name public is um, encouraging other people to speak out. Um, do you think that there are any cases where that is an acceptable sort of principle to take? So, for example, with Harvey Weinstein, a lot of the encouragement to speak, uh, encouragement to speak out was a large part of making the whole case public, and I think that's why it was such a significant moment for, for a crime. Should I go first on that, or would you like to go Later. first? Well, you mentioned Harvey Weinstein. Uh, there was a record once by Rick James called Super Freak. And, and uh, let me tell you, Harvey Weinstein was super creep. Um, but I knew that from the male perspective, um, from people who'd been working with him in films and about how oddly cruel he was to the men who worked on his films, how he not only had to get the better of them, but he had to belittle them, mm. such as by holding them by the throat in a public theater or uh, saying, your work is no good, I'm going to replace you. Uh, I wasn't surprised when I began to hear things about his unpleasant treatment of women because he unpleasantly treated men, just in a different way. But 
the whole Me Too, Me Too movement was a different creature from the British witch hunt because the British witch hunt was police-led. Mm. The American Me Too movement uh, was social media-led and didn't involve uh, arresting people and talking about them before they were charged. These were people who were just saying, just saying, as they say now, uh, this person did something to me. Um, th there's a difference between personal statements, which there will always be, mm. and state-encouraged campaigns uh, against designated individuals. Those are two different things. Uh, if someone, as has been said, uh, makes an accusation against a public figure in America uh, and it comes to nothing, then uh, you realize this may be one in which there was nothing. There's such a wide range of possibilities that in almost every case you have to admit the existence of the wide range of possibilities. But when it's uh, a police-inspired campaign in which there is zero evidence that the two people had even ever met. Mm. I mean, again, I can only use my own case. There wasn't a single piece of evidence that I'd met these uh, two people. Incidentally, the two people were my accuser and his best friend. There was never a signed photograph mentioned or a, uh, a phone number on a piece of paper. The kind of things you would expect if you'd had a relationship with somebody. Zero. So the police arrived at 4.38 in the morning in my place, eight of them, and, uh, and they start looking for what? Because nothing had been mentioned. They were just having a good old trawl, and they kept my items for 14 months. So I think there is a difference between a, uh, a police-led campaign and a social media campaign. You will find, when you scratch the flesh of any of us, who were in this campaign, that our thoughts are harshest on the police because they were the most dishonest organization I've ever encountered. And it'll blow your brains out to hear about how dishonest they are. Mm -hmm. um, agreed. Can I just add a word about anonymity mm -hmm. um, on your uh, question specifically on that? And the biggest argument, um, and this wide-ranging debate on this, of course, mm -hmm. is that it will deter complainants from coming forward. I think that's what you were getting at. And what we've tried to do is achieve a balance. In other words, we're saying anonymity until charge, because, of course, after that point, mm -hmm. other people can come forward. We saw it in the Rolf Harris case, although, ironically, in that case, the second trial resulted in acquittals. But um, there is provision there, so we've tried to achieve balance. The other balancing factor here, remember we're talking about protecting the reputations of individuals falsely charged mm. to try and create the, the balance is, is the matter I refer to in respect of the potential provision for lifting the ban on an application to a judge. And then to answer your question sp specifically on that, a judge in his or her discretion will then take all the circumstances of the case into account when deciding whether or not to lift the ban. And it's at that balancing point that, that a decision would have to be made. So that's in regard to the safety of, of, of the people around them. Precisely. Interesting. I think um, in terms of, I was actually going to do a bit more moderation, but I do think people will have questions from the floor. And given we're running out of time, I'd quite like to open up the questions. Um, so we're now moving into the floor. Please, uh, if you'd like to ask a question, raise your hand and wait for a microphone to get to you. Um, would you like to start? Um, well, I actually have two questions. Um, the first question is, given the number of occasions on which the anonymity of rape victims has been compromised by the media, do you think that an anonymity requirement for people accused but not yet charged would be able to stick? The other question I would like to ask is, one that is more subtle, but I think affects the attitude of the police. And that is, does anyone have any statistics as to the proportion of people who sexually assault women who have sexually assaulted more than one woman? Because I suspect it's actually quite small. Um, should, I go, should I go first on the first? I don't know the answer to your second. Um, 
what, just, just, um, my, my mind's just gone in respect to the second one. Um, does it stick was your, first, was your question, wasn't it? Would it stick? Yeah, I've got it. Um, well, it does stick in relation to anonymity for complainants uh, because the law comes in very... It's, you're committing a criminal offence if you breach it. Um, I think it would stick because the provision which we're seeking would also um, involve a criminal offence uh, if there's a breach. So I think it would stick. So um, uh, we've got, uh, as it were, a track record in relation to complainants. So I think it would work. And um, the problem is getting it through Parliament. In fact, the problem is getting anything through Parliament at the moment. You asked um, the first part of your question, uh, which is, uh, can you make it stick if you achieve anonymity before charge in law? And it's always hard to know if you can get the horse back in the door. Uh, but all of us in this room over, say, 35, will remember the expression that used to follow the broadcast of an arrest, which is, a man is helping police with their inquiries. That's what you would always hear. It was a way of letting the, the public know someone has been arrested or is at least being questioned, so they're on the case, and you'll hear more about it. It's only because of uh, social media and the need for immediate gratification that people want solutions today, now. But in complicated cases like this, or sophisticated cases, which, if they are of a historic nature, require research, perhaps forensic examination, you can't have an answer today. So it's the speed of communication which we now have against the reality of justice. And I, I fortunately, am an optimist in life. I've, even when bad things have happened, I believe that things will turn out okay. So I have to believe that if we, we change the law, then we start to change attitudes. Do we have anyone for one last question? Oh, your second one also. <laughs> um, should we? And then we'll wrap. <coughs> um, does the law of anonymity that you're seeking, does that exist in any other countries already? And if so, does it work? Um, it works in New Zealand. Um, we are actually carrying out research now to see how widespread it is. Um, so, um, sorry to give you a rather poor answer to that, but we know it works in certainly one other country in another jurisdiction, and it does work. I might add that actually uh, it, there was to an extent anonymity provided, I think it was in 1978, when the law did provide for anonymity in respect of uh, rape only, not sexual offences, and then uh, the law was repealed. So it was in existence for some years, and what we're trying to do is to revert to what the law was before it was repealed in the Sexual Offences, I think it was 1978 um, Amendment Act, and extend it not only to rape but other sexual offences. And I say it's sexual offences because what's goose for the, what well, source for the goose is source for the gander in respect of complainants. Isn't it also the case in Germany? I think it is Germany as yes, well. Yes, yeah. where there is anonymity all the way through the process until conviction. Yeah, so be beyond charge in Germany. Okay, so unfortunately we've run out of time. Uh, I have a couple of notices to make. So obviously thank you both for, for making the trip up here um, to talk about such an important topic and have such a significant discussion with us today. Um, I'd also like to thank the AV team and the stewards for making this event possible. Um, in regards to further events this week, we'll be hosting a debate on This House Please AI Will Bring More Harm Than Good tomorrow at 8 p.m. with IBM. And on Sunday, we are hosting Anan Kumar and the Bangladeshi High Commissioner. Um, lastly, a note. Um, so obviously at the Cambridge Union, we're established to defend free speech, and we consistently try to have conversations about issues that matter and impact our world today. Um, however, this means that inevitably some of the conversations that we have are inherently quite difficult and emotionally trying. 
So as a result, we're trying to consistently improve the way in which these discussions are held and conducted in order to, to ensure that the union continues to be a space where everyone feels welcome and respected. So if you do have any comments about our discussion today, um, please email me at president at cus.org um, or if you prefer our women and marginalized genders officer at women's.officer at cus.org or come find me in the office for a face-to-face -face chat. Um, but yeah, this is definitely something that we're trying to work on is making sure that we're having these discussions but at the same time in a way that's that's facilitates everyone being comfortable. Thank you, everyone.